Welcome to the first episode of the Dr. Money Matters podcast. I'm your host, Dr. Tarang Patel, a practicing diagnostic radiologist in Phoenix, Arizona. I'm starting this podcast as a way to share knowledge about financial matters as they relate to healthcare professionals. We spent many years learning about the science and the art of providing patient care, but most of us have relatively little knowledge about reaching financial well-being. I know that I had no formal training in setting up investment accounts, negotiating contracts, buying insurance, buying real estate. I just learned by reading and also by making many mistakes. Healthcare professionals are trusted uh, to put their patient's need first, and we in turn assume that everyone in other fields work the same way. Unfortunately, it's not true. By talking about these topics, I hope we can reduce the many mistakes that previous generations of physicians, including myself, have made. Those physicians were able to overcome these mistakes because of shorter training periods, less debt, and they were more likely to be in private practice. Today, we no longer have many of those luxuries, and many of us have a significant debt burden. The good news is that we also have access to information that that generation never had. A little background about myself, I'm a practicing radiologist in Phoenix. I went to undergrad at Indiana University, go Hoosiers, medical school at the Kirksville College of Osteopathic Medicine in Missouri. I moved east and did my radiology residency at New York Hospital Weill Cornell Medical Center in Manhattan, and then moved west to serve my Air Force commitment at Nellis Air Force Base in Las Vegas. My wife and I decided to stay out in the warm sun, and I I did a fellowship in body and musculoskeletal imaging at Mayo Clinic, Arizona. Since that time, I've been in his hospital-employed group in Phoenix for the last six years. I've always enjoyed learning about personal finance, and other financial matters, and have read and listened to many of the financial books. I spent time on Boggleheads.org, the internet forum, which has been a valuable resource um, for all kinds of financial topics. And finally, I just observed that my colleagues and I had many of the same questions about basic financial matters, and yet had some difficulty in finding clear-cut answers. I also love listening to podcasts, and would like to give a shout out to the other doctors who are using podcasts and social media as a way of educating and inspiring their colleagues, including Dr. Nee Darko from Docs Outside the Box, the Happy Doc podcast, as well as the Passive Income MD and Physician on Fire blogs. And I'd also like to specifically acknowledge the white coat investor, Dr. Jim Dolly, who I guess was in the Air Force around the same time as I was, but I never had the pleasure of meeting him. He's done a really good job in educating doctors about the basics of personal finance. Hopefully you find these podcasts useful. I encourage you to subscribe to them, and that way you'll be updated when any new episodes are released. Also, please let your friends and colleagues know about this podcast. Give us good feedback if you are so inclined on iTunes, Google Play, or Stitcher. It helps with the ratings of the podcast. And if you have any suggestions or topics on how we can improve Uh, please send your emails to comments at drmoneymatters.com. That's spelled out D-O-C-T-O-R-M-O-N-E-Y-M-A-T-T-E-R-S.com. Comments at drmoneymatters.com. And you can find me on Twitter at drmoneymatters, which is not spelled out, at D-R-M-O-N-E-Y-M-A-T-T-E-R-S. Twitter doesn't let you spell out that many characters. Uh, And finally, I, I encourage you to join the Dr. Money Matters Facebook group where we are trying to encourage discussion of these topics. It's a private group, so you will have to request membership, but then your comments won't be available to the general public, so you can have a little bit more of a free discussion. Thanks, and welcome to episode one of the Dr. Money Matters podcast. This is uh, a Dr. Money Matters podcast. This is our first episode, and I'm happy to have as our guest, Jamie Fleischner from Set for Life Insurance based out of uh, Denver, Colorado. Jamie is, uh, holds the following designations, CLU, Chartered Life Underwriter, CHFC, Chartered Financial Consultant, and also, according to your website, Jamie, a first-degree black belt in Taekwondo. So Yes, that's right. That's right. So we're definitely going to listen to you. <laughs> so, uh, Jamie, if you could, tell us a little bit about yourself and what got you into uh, the insurance business. Well, first of all, thank you for having me. I'm really excited to be your first person. I know we've worked together for a couple of years, and it's exciting to see physicians like you out there and helping others. So a little bit of background. 
I actually grew up in the insurance business. My father was in the business life insurance business. So I grew up kind of being exposed to the business. I went to college, Washington University in St. Louis and got a degree in business. And while I was there, I decided to do an internship to learn more about the insurance business, thinking, you know, maybe I can just test it out and see what I, if I like it. And I ended up really enjoying the business. I didn't want to stay in St. Louis, so I wanted to come back to Denver. So I came back to Denver after I graduated and immediately started working in the business. And about six months in, my mom became very ill, waiting for a double lung transplant, had an autoimmune disease. And so I was starting my business, taking care of her. And so both of those events really impacted my outlook on the importance of disability insurance and sparked my interest in that field. And so she ended up not getting the lung transplant and died about 18 months later, but it had a really big impact on me. And through that process, I've really focused my business working in the disability insurance field, primarily in the medical market, physicians, dentists, optometrists, physician assistants, CRNAs, all of those types of people. I feel like they understand the need for disability insurance and how vulnerable they can be, what it takes for them to not be able to work. And I've expanded my business over the years. So I've been doing this now 23 years, worked with thousands of different people. I'm in all 50 states. I work with all different people all over the country. And that's where I am today. Well, that's an amazing story. I mean, most of us as physicians, we see the side of, you know, patients having terminal issues, critical issues, but we never really think of it from our own perspective if that impacts us. And it sounds like you were, you know, being personally affected by something like this, we're able to use that and help physicians and other healthcare professionals. So I want to thank you for your service to us and helping us situate our lives and get our financial situations in order to better help patients. So thank you, Jamie. Thank you for your service. You're welcome. As Jamie mentioned, we had worked together for a couple of years in the sense that I purchased my own disability insurance through Jamie about five, five and a half years ago. And she made it very simple, explained everything very well. But beyond that, I haven't really had any contact with Jamie, and that's kind of how you want disability insurance to go. But when I started this podcast, I remembered my experience with her. So I wanted to get her take on the questions that many physicians have when they come out of residency, when they or when they start uh, practice, or even sometimes later in life when they decide to get their uh, financial situations in order. Disability insurance, we all know we need it. In a nutshell, what what does disability insurance do for us? So what disability insurance does and the importance of it is if you are dependent on your income, meaning you're working because you need that income, it needs to be protected. And so what disability insurance does is if something happens, by definition, a sickness or an injury, which precludes you from being able to work and bring home your paycheck or your income, it replaces that income. So you can maintain your quality of life. So you're still able to pay your bills, you're still able to pay your student loans, and you're able to sustain yourself without going into debt and to keep you sustainable. So that's really the goal of disability insurance. And so most physicians, you know, they're, when they're starting out their career, a lot of them have debt, a lot of them don't have a tremendous amount in savings, and they have a large career ahead of them. And that's when it becomes important to protect that income. And, and a lot of people ask me, you know, how long do I need to carry the disability insurance? And really the answer is you want to be able to carry it until you're able to self-insure. So if you get to a point where you're working now because you want to, but you really have enough in savings to sustain yourself, then it becomes, do you need to have it or do you just want to keep it because you've had it all this time and maybe your health has changed? So like you mentioned at the beginning, when we're coming out of residency, I mean, they've always told us that, you know, generally that's the best time to get the insurance. What is the differences if I was, let's say, uh, a second year resident and, you know, I'm, I'm looking at this and of course, like you said, I'm paying back my loans, I'm making not that much money. What is the advantage of me starting at that point to get my disability insurance? Well, really the advantage of getting it earlier on is when you purchase disability insurance, you have to actually qualify for it medically. So the younger you are, typically the healthier you are. So if you're younger and you're able to qualify for it, you get the policy at that time, and then you have the option in the future of purchasing more as your income increases, but when you go to increase it in the future, there's no medical questions. So really the advantage, the earlier you get it, the healthier you are, you don't have to worry about a change in health at a later time. That's really the benefit. And typically, you know, when you're in training or in medical school or in residency, I typically 
recommend just a small minimal policy just to be able to increase it in the future, but not overpaying, not buying a significant size policy because you're on a tight budget. So really the whole purpose of it earlier on is just to be able to ensure your later income. And one of the things that they always talk about is own occupation versus a regular disability insurance. Can you, can you talk a little bit about that? Yes. Now, the most important part of the contract is the definition disability because this determines whether or not they're going to pay a claim. So if you have a weak definition, you're less likely to get paid on benefits. Now, most individual policies have what's called own occupation. And what that states is if due to sickness or injury, you can't work in your medical specialty, they're going to pay you benefits regardless of income earned elsewhere. You know, in the, in a lot of people use the example of a surgeon, something happens, you're not able to use your hands, you know, you get bad arthritis, you can receive benefits even if you can go back and retrain and do psychiatry or research or teaching or medical sales. As long as you can't do surgery, it's going to pay you your benefits. Now, most individual policies do have own occupation on the policy, and, and sometimes they're called different things. Sometimes they're called regular occupation or your occupation, but as long as you have that language in the policy, you're fine. Most group policies, however, do not have own occupation, or they only have it for one or two years. Thereafter, they say if you're able to work in any occupation, they will not pay you your benefit. And the reason a group policy is not going to be as comprehensive is they can't individually select and they can't underwrite. So they're going to take the whole pool of people who are eligible and provide a policy for them. And they can't say this person's healthy, this person isn't. There are one or two companies out there that only have own occupation for one or two years. And thereafter, it's any occupation. And the real downside of that for a physician is after those two years, if you're on claim, again, same example of the surgeon, if you're capable of being gainfully employed or working like that surgeon is, they're not going to pay you a benefit. So it's really important that you, not only is your policy own occupation, but it's own occupation for the full period of the policy. And so going to the group policy versus getting your own policy, I'm glad you brought that up because a lot of times medical students, residents, dental students, we get mailings from uh, the American Medical Association, the American Dental Association, even through your own hospital. So you mentioned that those are basically group policies. Is that correct? Well, actually, well, there's three different kinds of policies. There's the individual policy, which is going to be the most comprehensive and you have to go through the underwriting. It's also going to be the most expensive. Then you have the association policy, which is almost like a hybrid between a group and an individual policy. So you're able to purchase it individually. Oftentimes you don't have the underwriting, but as a result, it's not as comprehensive. It's typically only own occupation for one or two years and the rates are not guaranteed. So an association policy has age banded rates. So the mistake a lot of young physicians have is they purchase a policy when they're younger saying, wow, this is inexpensive. It's a lot less expensive than an individual policy that every time they have a birthday that ends with a five or a zero, their rates go way up. And then what happens is they get into their 40s. It's very expensive. They try to apply for their own policy and now they have trouble getting it. So association policies, while they look appealing initially, if you read the fine print, they're not going to be as comprehensive as an individual policy and the rates aren't guaranteed. Then the third kind is the group policy, which is typically offered through an employer. Sometimes you have to take those policies. They need to have, a, they usually need about 70% participation because otherwise the healthy people would all go out and get their own policy. So if you do have a group policy, you can still supplement with an individual policy, but you may be limited how much you have. So the group policy usually will provide, say, 60% of your income. The employer's paying for it, so it's taxable. So an individual policy will bridge the gap between what the group provides and how much you need to insure. Okay. So actually, that brings up a question that I've had and I've, a couple of my colleagues have had. We um, have our own disability, but we also have from from our hospital as well. And the question was, is there a maximum that you can purchase? Is there, you know, for some of the people in uh, higher paying specialties, such as surgeons, dermatologists, uh, anesthesiologists, radiologists, is there a cap that you can get? Is it is it better to reach, get, you know, more through your own policy? That's actually a really good question. So yes, there is a limit on how much you can get. So 
typically, now group policies usually cover 60% of your income to a limit, usually say 10,000, 15,000. And so the higher your income, the less replacement that's going to provide. So you can supplement on top of that. Now, the max amount you're eligible for is based on your income and your group benefits in force. So if you do have a group policy, the maximum aggregate benefit you can have is 30,000 a month benefit. So again, depending on your income, if you're eligible for that. So if your group is providing 15, you may be able to get 15 elsewhere. If you don't have a group policy, the maximum individual benefits you can get is up to 25,000 per month. And again, the individual policy is a tax-free benefit. Now the group policies can be tax-free or can be pre-tax, depending on how you pay for it. Generally, I think- If the employer's paying for it, it's taxable. If you pay for it, it's tax-free. Gotcha. Another question, they can be different costs for men and women, correct? That's correct. So um, disability insurance is priced based on gender. Women pay on average twice as much as men do. However, there are unisex rates available. That's actually a big area that we work all over the country uh, with unisex rates. For females, if you're able to get a unisex rate, it'll reduce your premium by about 70%. It's pretty significant. And I've actually, I've talked to the head of companies about this saying, Do they really have 70% more claims? And they do have more claims, but the problem is women tend to stay on claim for a longer period of time. So there's more autoimmune types of diseases, those types of things, which sometimes make them a higher risk. But once you have a policy, if you get a unisex policy, once you have that on the policy, that's permanent, that never leaves. And when you go to increase the benefits, it's still at a unisex rate. So it is a big deal to get those. Nowadays, it's greater than 50 or 55% of uh, medical students are female. So it's very important information. Another question, and this applied to me when I came, I was uh, an active duty Air Force member. So at the time, I was under the impression that I was not able to purchase disability either in residency or during my active duty time. Is that still the case? Yeah, it is really tough to get policies when you're active duty military. They used to be able to provide those. And then we were able to get those through Lloyd's of London. Now we have to actually wait until you're no longer active duty to purchase a policy. If you already have a policy and then become active duty, you can actually put your policy on suspension during that period of time. So you're not paying premiums and then you can resume the policy when you're no longer active military. And and I I do believe military members have their own government sponsored uh, disability. Although from what I remember, and this is just kind of stretching my brain back to remember, it wasn't quite as good as the policies that you can get on your own. Yeah, but it's better than nothing. Yes, absolutely. Absolutely. There, there were specific riders and clauses that uh, were important in disability insurance. I believe the cost of living adjustment. So if you could just talk about that one, and then maybe I think there's a mental uh, nervous conditions also as a separate rider. Yeah, so there's a couple of things. So what a rider means is an extra benefit. Sometimes these things are built into the contract. Sometimes you have to add them in and pay extra. So there's a couple of really important things to make sure your policy has. All individual policies should have non-cancelable guaranteed renewables. What that means is once you have your policy, the company can never modify or change your contract and they can never increase your premium. So that's really important. So they can't ever say we're having a rate increase or now we're no longer going to cover HIV. They can't do that. So that's the first thing. The second thing, you want to make sure that you have that own occupation definition. Uh, The third one, residual, that's a partial disability rider. That's very important and critical to have on your policy. What that does is it says instead of being totally disabled, you only have to have, and depending on the policy, 15 or 20% loss of income, and they'll pay that proportionate benefit. So if something happens, say you hurt your back, you can only work 50% of the time, you can still file a claim and get that proportion of your benefit. The cost of living rider, what that does is instead of getting a fixed benefit all the way until age 65, 67, however long your policy is, it will increase your benefits each year you're on claim. That's what the cost of living. And then a couple of other things, you want to make sure that there's the ability to increase benefits in the future without having to answer medical questions. And those come in all different types, benefit update, future increase options, benefit purchase. The companies all have different flavors of that, if you will, but you want to be able to increase it in the future. Okay. And while we're on this, one of the things, I I don't want to mention any specific brands of insurance, but there's certain ones that You've heard uh, physicians we've heard from, you know, our attendings or our mentors that are good companies. 
in your experience, there's probably a, a handful of companies that provide disability. Is, is any one significantly better than the other? No, they're not. And if somebody says this one is by far the best company, chances are that person works for that company. Or if they say, well, this company is A++ and you should never buy a policy that from an A++ company, again, chances are there's some bias there. There is not one company that is significantly better than the others. And, and that kind of goes a little bit off the topic, but when you're working with somebody, it's important that you make sure you're working with somebody who's actually independent. We work as an independent brokerage, so we don't work for any of these companies. So what I recommended for you might be totally different for a colleague of yours. Maybe they have health problems. Maybe they're a different gender or different specialty or different age. So it's important to be able to, you know, have access to all of those. But no, not one company is significantly better or different than the others. There might be some minor details that are different. You know, I wanted to talk a little bit about you you do more than disability insurance. You also work in the life insurance field and other insurances, I, I believe? Primary life insurance, and we also do long-term care. Okay, so if you if you could, just in a nutshell, there's, a, there's always a big controversy about life insurance, term life versus whole life slash universal. What is your general take on, on, on that? So my philosophy is a little bit different than a lot of other insurance people out there. I look as, at life insurance and the purpose of it is to cover the risk. So I'm a big proponent of term life insurance. So that's the majority of what I do. Sometimes there's extenuating circumstances where you need a permanent policy. And, and just for your, your people, just the big basic difference is a term policy is basically like rent. So you lock in your rate for 10, 15, 20, or 30 years. Your rate is fixed. Your benefit is fixed. If you die in that period of time, the benefits are paid. At the end of that period of time, the policy expires. And so that's a term policy. A permanent policy is a lot more complicated. The rates are fixed and guaranteed for your whole life. It accumulates cash on a tax-free basis, but it's significantly more expensive. So I do almost exclusively term life insurance. Now, in terms of how much do you need to have, life insurance becomes important when somebody else is dependent on you. So if you get married or you have a child or something of that nature, that's when it becomes really important. Rule of thumb, just to make it simple, is you need to have about 12 times your income to be able to replace your income. And you want it in force until your youngest dependent is up and out of the house about age 25. So for you know young family, just having their first child, they're making $200,000 a year. They would probably need about, you know, two, $2.5 million 30 year term. But you can obviously, you know, like we were talking earlier about the high, high income specialists for as much as you can early is what I was told. Is that what you would say or? Um, yeah, I mean, I think, again, the younger you are, the less expensive it is to get it. And again, if you anticipate, OK, I'm going to be getting married and have a bunch of kids and I'm young and I'm healthy, yeah, you can get it earlier on. Although if you're single and nothing coming up on the horizon, yes, you can get it to protect your insurability, but it's not imminent. It's not necessary to get it right away. Last thing, I think you had mentioned that you also do long-term care insurance. Talk talk a little bit about that and how it relates to uh, physicians uh, or, or I guess any other high-income earners. So really, long-term care is sort of a sister product to disability insurance, the way I look at it. So disability insurance covers your income in your working years. So if you're dependent on your income, it pays for that. Long-term care really protects your retirement years. And what happens is if it's more catastrophic than disability because in order to file a claim, you have to be unable to do activities of daily living, which so for instance, if you have a stroke, you know, if you're not able to, you need somebody to help you walk or eat or transfer, or if you are diagnosed with um, Alzheimer's or something of that nature, dementia, it will pay a claim. And so what it does is it pays a daily benefit to be able to take care of the cost of that care because the cost of that care could be very, very expensive. So instead of having to self-fund it and use up all your retirement for it, you can purchase a long-term care policy. Now, when is the ideal time to purchase a long-term care policy? I don't even recommend even considering it until you're in your 50s. And the reason being is it's different than disability insurance. The rates are not locked in and guaranteed. So if you start paying for this in your 40s, thinking you're locking in your rate, your rates are going to continue going up and you're going to be paying premiums all these years. And you may not even use it until you're, you're in your 80s. So and there's a bit a lot of changes in that marketplace. So but if you are in your 50s or you know, approaching retirement and you're sort of phasing out of your disability, that might be a good time to start looking into long term care and seeing are you able to self-fund it or do you not want to self-fund it? 
and be able to take care of that risk. Well, that, that's that's good to know. It's it's refreshing to hear someone say, "Don't even consider a, a product that they happen to sell until you have you know until you need it." So <laughs> that that's that's good to know. But it, so what I'm understanding is maybe as you get towards your 50s and you're thinking, you know, you may have already built up an asset base, and maybe your need for disability insurance starts decreasing because you've you've already got built an asset base. Maybe that time. You think, uh, would it be, you can trade it, not trade it, but, uh, you know, use the money. Transfer the risk. Exactly. Yeah, exactly. Yeah, yeah. Okay. Okay. Good. Well, Jamie, thank you very much. I, I think this has been very helpful and I hope our listeners have enjoyed talking to you as much as I, I have. If you could just tell me a little bit about your company and where our listeners can find out more information about you and uh, Set for Life Insurance. So we're based out of Denver, Colorado. The best way to reach us is through our website, which is setforlifeinsurance.com, S-E-T-F-O-R-L-I-F-E, insurance, all spelled out, dot com. So we have a lot of information on there, information about who we are. If people are interested, they can just click on request a quote or they can contact us directly. And we're happy to answer questions. A lot of times people contact us and say, gosh, I've had this policy for all these years. Do I have the right policy? And, you know, we're not here to replace what you already have or degrade somebody else's work, but we're willing to look at it and say, is this going to be the most optimal policy for you? Or if people have questions or they are in the in the market for it, yeah, reach out and contact us and um, we're happy to help them. Great. Great. Thank you. A second opinion. Well, we're, we're all familiar with that. So, uh, well, thank you, Jamie. Appreciate it. And it's uh, been a pleasure talking to you. All right. Thank you so much. All right. Thanks for listening to the first episode of the Dr. Money Matters podcast. Thanks again to my guest, Jamie Fleischner from Set for Life Insurance for breaking down disability and life insurance for us. I really appreciate Jamie for being brave enough to be my first guest and also for helping healthcare professionals in general. If you have enjoyed this podcast, please leave a positive review on iTunes, Google Play, or Stitcher, and let your colleagues know about this podcast. If you have some constructive criticism, please send an email to comments at drmoneymatters.com, and we'll try to improve. That's drmoneymatters.com, spelled out D-O-C-T-O-R-M-O-N-E-Y-M-A-T-T-E-R-S.com. Please remember what you've heard on this show is for your entertainment and education only. Speak with the appropriate experts prior to making any changes regarding your own financial situation. Thanks again, and look for episode two with Dr. Joel Greenwald, a practicing internist turned financial advisor of Greenwald Wealth Management in Minnesota. Thank you.